Good morning. Thanks for being here. It is a blessing to be a part of the body of Christ, and I hope that you find it to be so as well. Though I understand that we're not used to thinking that way at all. We're used to thinking about ourselves and our salvation. But the truth is, apart from the body of, the, of believers, we are nothing. We're like a finger that got cut off and is laying at the side of the road without the body of Christ. Useless because we're separated from the body um, that gives us meaning and function. It's only in the context of the body that we find our place in Christ. And that's why being one just as the Father and Son are one is so important. If every part of the body does just what it wants, then it's like your body having an epileptic fit or a seizure of some kind. And unfortunately, that is increasingly the history of the church since the Reformation and actually even before that. Everyone doing what is right in their own eyes until we as in, and until we as individuals become willing to die to ourselves and our desires so that we may be one of one will with the Father, there's no hope for the church to fulfill that which God has called it to be, which is the reconciler of the world to the Father. That's what we're called to do. At least that's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says this, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to him and gave us us the ministry of reconciliation that is in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message to us entrusting to us the message of reconciliation therefore we are ambassadors to the world God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. See, at, at this point, we aren't able to reconcile the church, never mind the world. The body of Christ is basically one big seizure that happens 24-7 365 days a year. Every part of the body refuses to trust the other parts of the body. Those hair follicles over there, well, they don't have skin. They can't be, in the, they can't be a part of the body. Those teeth things over there, they only go up and down and grind stuff. They never touch the ground. How can they be a part of the body of Christ? And on and on and on. When... Will the body stop having internal warfare seizures and become one like God and the Father? Like Jesus and the Father are one. I don't know. All I know is that to be reconcilers of the world to God, we must first as a body be reconciled to God and to each other. With every part striving to do what the head, Jesus Christ, tells us to do. That doesn't mean we're going to be clones and everyone think and do exactly the same things. It means that we need to be asking God, what part of the body am I and how should I function in the midst of all of these other parts? What, we, what should we be doing to build up the rest of the body so that they can function at their full level as well? So that we as a whole can do what we're supposed to be doing and actually be the body of Christ reconciling the world to the Father. I'm trusting that God is big enough to actually do that. Though I have to beg Him to remove the unbelief from my eyes because I'm asking for something that I've never seen. See, I have more faith that Jesus was raised from the dead than I do that the body of Christ will be one as Jesus and the Father are one. Um, I think it would be a bigger miracle for the church to become one than it was to raise Jesus from the dead. 
I trust that in spite of my unbelief, God will bring about that which he demands, demands of his body. It's not an option. And God's got all the time in the world. We're not getting out of here until the body is one, until the bride of Christ is ready to be married. And as long as the bride of Christ is filled up with parts and seizures, Jesus isn't coming back. God has no timeline. He has, he has an outcome line. Anyway, let's stop and pray right now. Father God, you desire that the body of Christ should be one just as you and Jesus are one. I ask you, Almighty God, to begin that work here in our midst. I ask that you would take Emmanuel Church, the church whose name declares that you are with us, and make us like you. Do whatever it takes to make us one. Whatever stands in the way of that oneness, I ask that you would remove it from our midst. Be that people or ideas or theology or stubbornness or selfishness or past or the past or anything. Whatever stands in the way of us being what you want us to be one like Jesus and the Father are one, I ask that you would do it. I beg that you would make Emmanuel one as you are. I would also ask that you would do it as quickly as humanly possible. I ask all of this in the power and authority of Jesus, your Son, King of heaven and earth, now and forever. Please make it so. Amen. Let's go to the Scriptures. Mark chapter 11. Yes, it's in your bulletin this week. Mark chapter 11. We're going to start with verse 12. I'm going to read... Uh, through verse 14, and then I'm going to jump down to verse 20, and we'll deal with verses 14 through whatever, 19 next week. Um, remember last week we ended with Jesus going into the temple and looking around, and then going home and going to bed. Okay. Uh, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now let's jump down to verse 20. As they passed by the next morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. And Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you that whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you will have received it, and it will be yours. And whenever you stand in prayer, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father, who is also in heaven, may forgive your trespasses. It seems that this whole event is about faith. But I don't think it's about the type of faith that we believe in these days. I don't think it's the name and claim it type uh, that's so often proclaimed. I don't think it's a passage to say you can pray for anything you want and you'll get it. I think that this is closely tied to Ju Jesus going to the temple the day before and the part that we overlooked today, Jesus going back to the temple the second time. Uh, what he probably felt and saw when he was in the temple both of those times was the spirit of unbelief in the church itself. You see, the first century church uh, was much more rooted in the Old Testament than we are. So when Jesus curses the fig tree, it's not about the tree. It's a bold proclamation of Jeremiah chapter 8 especially verses 4 through 13. Let me read that to you. For you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord, When men fall, do they not rise again? If one turns away, does he not return? 
Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They refuse to return. I have paid attention and listened, but they have, spoke, they have not spoken rightly, so that man relents of his evil, saying, What have I done? Everyone turns to his own course like a horse plowing, plunging headlong into battle. Even the stork in the heavens know their times, and the turtle dove and swallow and a crane keep the time of their coming. But my people know not the rules of the Lord. How can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? But behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men shall be put to shame. They shall be dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom is in them? Therefore, I will give to their wives to others, uh, give their wives to others, their fields to conquerors, because from the least to the greatest, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. From prophet to priest, everyone deals falsely. Now, you need to realize that Jeremiah is writing this after the exile. The people are already back in the land. And this is still their state. They learned nothing. And in fact, if you read uh, much of the stuff that's written in the time of Jesus, the Jews understood that they were still in exile because the prophecies had not come true. They understood themselves to be in exile. Verse 11, there, and I, I may finish. They have healed the wound of my people lightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among the fallen. When I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. And then he says this, and this is what ties it into the fig tree. When I would gather them, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine nor figs on the fig tree. Even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them passed away from them. What Jesus is doing when he curses the fig tree is acting out a prophecy in visual and physical form. He's basically saying that Jeremiah's prophecy is about to come completely true. He is cursing the fig tree literally, and the fig tree is Israel. And so too will the nation of Israel be completely cursed just like the rest of the nations and never bear fruit for God again. Its days are numbered. Certainly this does not apply to the individuals that are of the nation Israel just like it doesn't apply to all the other cursed nations of which every one of us have come to the Father in repentance out of. Um, it is the nation of Israel which has ended up being like all the other nations in complete rebellion against God. Why then does Jesus in Matthew follow up the cursing of the fig tree with comments about faith? And also uh, Luke here, I mean Mark here. Let's read those again. He says, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and throw to the, thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever ha you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Again, we've isolated the New Testament from the Old Testament. And we think that Jesus is saying, well, if you've got enough faith, you can move an actual mountain. But from an Old Testament perspective, he is basically talking about the kingdom of Babylon here, which is a picture of the kingdoms of this world that are under the, dom the do dominion of the accuser. To understand it, let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above, above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. Here the nations are described as mountains and hills. The kingdom of God is the highest mountain and all the nations will eventually flow into it. From every, in other words, there will be a great multitude which no one could number from every nation, from all tribes, peoples, and languages standing before the throne and the Lamb clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. 
That's what he's promising. That's what Isaiah is looking for. Everyone flowing into the kingdom of God, everyone who humbles themselves before God and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Jesus comments about faith in relationship to these two things, the cursing of the fig tree and the moving of mountains. Uh, And simply, it means if you have enough faith, unbelievers will be cursed and their power taken away from them and the kingdoms that they have built will be destroyed and thrown into the sea, into chaos, which is what the sea represented in many Old Testament passages. And as Daniel tells King Nebuchadnezzar, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all the kingdoms and bring them to to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has been made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. In the context of where we are in the book of Matthew, these things are fast approaching for Jesus and the apostles, disciples. The stone which the builders will soon reject, will be the stone that destroys the kingdom of rebellion. I've never really been able to see these things before because I've looked at scriptures with eyes that couldn't see what was actually in the text because I'd been given glasses that made me see things differently than than what the word says. I've only recently begun to take off those glasses and begin to see things differently. As I've said before, I'm in transition, not of my own doing, but God is forcing me to see the scriptures in a different light. And the result, as a result, see the way that he's working in the world in a totally different way. Last week, I told you that I was taught that the world was supposed to get worse and worse until Jesus would have to come back and and rescue it. Now, I realize that Jesus rescued the world over 2,000 years ago. The kingdom has been here for all those years. And I'm still working through the details of these things, so please bear with me. But I understand that Israel fulfilled its purpose back in the days of Jesus by demonstrating that the law of God was powerless to save people. They found themselves under the curse of the law. Jesus, as the Messiah, became the representative for Israel. He took all of Israel's sins and all of the other nation's sins and he took them on him and he sacrificed himself, the very thing that Israel refused to do. And he became all of our salvation, the only way to salvation. The keeping of the old covenant does not bring salvation to anyone. It cannot, because the law, as the New Testament tells us, is powerless over sin. Powerless. All those who humble themselves before God will be saved. You know, the the Jews found themselves, after all these hundreds of years, still under the curse of the law, more under the curse of the law than ever before. Now, in a few days, all who humble themselves will be, before God will be saved. There's only one kind of salvation by faith through the blood of Jesus. The old, the old covenant was never meant to save anybody. It was meant to show that everyone from every nation, even Israel, was under the condemnation of sin. And after it demonstrated that, it was meant to provide a way to pay for sins and provide for righteousness. It has done all that it can do, and it is now obsolete. As the writer of Hebrews tells us, the old covenant is obsolete. It has no merit before God. No one will ever be saved by the old covenant, period. Its job was to provide for the new covenant. 
There is only one way to be saved in the entire history of the world, and that is through faith in God who will make a way. The Jews understood that. At least the ones that walked humbly with their God, they never saw the law as a means of salvation. They were not expecting their law keeping to save them. They knew that salvation came by grace through faith. That may come as a surprise to, you, to, to many of us uh, because we've always been taught that the, the, the Old Testament is about being saved by works. That is a reformational understanding of first century Judaism. But if you read things about first, Ju- first century Judaism, you'll understand that they believed that they were saved by grace. Their problem wasn't that they were trying to be saved by works. Their problem was they thought they were the only ones that were going to be saved by grace. That was the problem. They thought they were special, and God had to show them that they weren't special. Um, you know, they got arrogant toward the Gentiles, the lost. Guess what? Just like the church does today. We love to look down on sinners as if we're better than them because we have grace and they don't. It's sad to me that not much has changed. The church has, for the most part, become like Israel in the time of Jesus. I'm beginning to see that it really has to be that way for the simple reason that we would have nothing to boast for in relation to Israel. I think the last 2,000 years have probably proven that pretty adequately. It's my prayer that now by the, that the playing field has been leveled for all nations, that God might be ready once again to begin to advance his kingdom in the same way he did in the first century when Jesus was here. My heart aches for that. I want what, would, what is promised in full. And I'm begging God to let me catch a glimpse of it begin to unfold here before I, live, before I leave this age behind. Next week, we'll go back... And, and look uh, at his time in the temple and show that this thing that he did in the temple was basically saying what the condition of Israel was and that how Israel was now going to be rejected. He's rejecting it, not because they're sinners, but because they rejected God and turned the temple into a store into a store, not unlike the church today has done. Turn the church into a store. And where our churches are all about, how big can our budgets be and how can we make our budgets? God doesn't give a rat's behind about any of that. He wants his people to be one as he is and Jesus are one. And he's going to destroy us until we get there, get there. He's he's not pleased with where the church is today. His heart is broken over his church, who does just like the old church did. We're supposed to be different, but we say, look what we have done with our own hands. Look at how businesslike we run the church. Look at how many people we can throw through like cattle just so we can get their tithes and offerings and teach them a few ideas. God doesn't care if you know theology. He wants to change your life from the inside out. He wants to make you into a new person. He doesn't care what your theology is. He knows that if your heart is right, he will change your theology. But your theology can oftentimes stand in the way of God changing your heart. And he will not change your heart if you don't want your heart changed. Thus the reason he's going to begin to do a new thing. A new thing. And the old stuff is going to pass away. This old stuff that has only been here for a couple hundred years, this way we do church. Jesus is going to be doing some unbelievably extraordinary things in the next two or three or four thousand years. I, 
I just hope I get to taste just a little bitty, bitty taste of it before I die. I want to see the Spirit of God poured out so that lives can be transformed, not covered up and hidden, which is what most of the church does. We carry our sins around in a little corner right here, and we let them out when nobody else is around. Jesus wants to take care of them, bring healing there, bring the fruits of the Spirit. He wants to bring self-control, which is stopping sin. The reason we sin is because we don't have the fruit of the Spirit. Self-control, because we don't have love, and we don't have joy. We don't have any of the fruits of the Spirit. We have the fruits of theology, and they are not the same thing. They are not the same thing. There are going to be plenty of people who had 100% correct theology burning in hell because they did not have the fruits of the Spirit. See, if you have the Spirit, you have to have the fruits. The fruits have to be demonstrated. If you don't have the fruits, you don't have the Spirit. And the Spirit is a down payment on what Jesus did for you. In other words, you believe in Jesus, you're going to get the Spirit. And if you get the Spirit, you're going to get the fruits of the Spirit. And if you're not getting the fruits of the Spirit, you don't have the Spirit, period. That's what the scripture says. But we've theolog used our theology to get around all of that stuff. If you know these things, you're going to heaven when you die. Bull. Absolute bull. Nothing you know will get you into heaven. Only a, ha so a heart softened towards the living God will get you into the kingdom. That is the only thing. It's not about knowledge. It's about Letting Jesus love you and love you enough that he will change you from the inside out. I get passionate about this because I spent most of my Christian life in darkness, thinking that Christianity was a self-help program and knowing that I couldn't help myself. So I just had to cover it up and pretend. And I was really good at pretending. And I can look like a Christian all day long. Because it's pretty easy to not do things in public that you, you know, you can lie. I, I'm one of the best liars there is. I know how to lie in order to look like a Christian. But I knew my heart the whole time. Thank God in the last five or six years, he started to change me from the inside out. I would have never said any of this stuff 10 years ago. Because I didn't believe it. I thought my theology was going to change, save me. I thought I had the right knowledge, and so everything was okay. I wasn't okay at all. I had to be killed, brought to the death of me so that I could live and be Jesus in my body. I got a long, 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 long way to go. Thank God he loves us just the way we are. And I don't have to arrive anywhere in order to be saved. I'm saved. I know that more than ever now. I'm saved not because I know things, but because God knows me. It's not a question of what do you know about God. It's does God know you? Does he really know you? I don't mean does he know about you. He knows everything about everybody. But does he know you? Does he have an intimate relationship with you? It's not about whether you have a relationship with him. It's about does he have a relationship with you? And until he has a relationship with you, you got squat. Nothing. Except a lot of words. And so, you know, it's my prayer that God would just radically transform us. I, I, I pray that he triples and quadruples the amount of change in my life over the next few years so that you will be able to see clearly the difference between the old me and the new me. And you'll clearly be able to see Jesus in me instead of a facade that just really reflect, reflects my knowledge of the scriptures. They're two totally different things. I want to be Jesus to you. And I'm not saying that because I'm psychotic and I think I want to be Jesus. I want to be Jesus to you because that's what it's all about. 
That's what our call is. I want to reconcile you to Jesus the way he is reconciling me to the Father. I, could, I, I, I can't do any more than that. I can only do that by the grace of God. Let's close with prayer. Oh, Father, have mercy on us. Make us one that your kingdom may truly advance here where we are. I ask that you'd begin to destroy the nations of the world, the rulers of the world, even now in the towns where we live in, in the families that we live in. I ask that you would follow up by demonstrating the lordship, your kingship, the kingship of Jesus in the midst of this church and in the midst of the parts of the body that are present here. And from that, begin to destroy the works of the enemy in our midst and in the midst of our families and then in our neighborhoods and then in our communities and then in our states. I say these things because I believe your word and I can see it with eyes that I've never had before. Thank you for that. I ask these things in the power and authority of Jesus, King of everything that exists. Please make it so. Amen. Thank you, guys.